Let me finish. <laughs> the second thing, one of the other second things that I did not get, that I was hoping to hear and hoping to look for, is a clear statement that Boston has an issue with racism. And I, I didn't hear that at all today. And I would have loved to hear that because that, to me, again, as a psychologist, I think of the only way to make changes is to acknowledge a problem. Okay, let me... Um I let me start with the, Can I do this one more thing on, so let, I can let, cover let, it all? Because I don't me, know if I have a chance let to Let me respond so I don't forget. Okay. Um, <laughs> Boston has an issue with racism. Great, thank you. Good morning, Boston. Lots of people have been in spaces with us who are in this room. They are used to the call and response process. So thank you very much. It is such a pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you. You look amazing. It's so good to see all of you, those who we know, who have been part of the process, those folks who we don't know who are here because they're committed to this work in the city of Boston. So I'm gonna be brief with my time in this moment because we have a, long, a, a, a nice program for you today. And we also have time for you to share with us your thoughts. And we're really excited about that because that's what this process has been about. So as we think about how we move forward as a city, as we think about the opportunities for us to work together to help build resilience, to strengthen racial equity, to make sure that we're confronting racism, that we do it together. And that we in the city of Boston have made this a priority under the leadership of Mayor Walsh, who has, with great boldness, with great courage, said that the city of Boston, not only will we talk about racism so that we can get to a shared set of language, shared framework about how we understand these issues, but also so that we can get to action. And thank you, Jim Rooney, for helping to underscore that point. So as we think about what today looks like, we're going to begin, after me, with the mayor. And I have the wonderful pleasure of getting to introduce him. But before I do that, I want to recognize the work that has been called out by Otis Rowley, which is the work of the collective people in this room from communities, from the private sector, from nonprofits, from government, how we came together in order to create the spirit and vision and direction for how we do this work with 100 resilient cities within the city of Boston and how we made it our own. That's what we do in Boston, we make it our own, right? And so where we're at right now in this moment is because of the work of many people. And I know many of you have been to a number of events and, uh, and uh, workshops and other presentations that we've hosted. So thank all of you for supporting us and guiding us on this journey. So I'm gonna ask all of you to take a seat, accept our sincerest appreciation for the work and support that you've offered to this process, many hours of time, so that we could arrive at today. And one of the things I wanted to share with everyone as we transition is we recognize that today is a moment in time. It is not going to have all of the diverse representations of people and perspectives on the stage today, but this is just the beginning. And I think you've heard from a number of folks that the journey we're about to take for 2017 is a shared journey, one where we're going to listen to each other, learn from each other, understand each other, so that we can move forward, address these hard challenges, make no mistake about it, they are hard challenges but that we're gonna do it together. We're gonna to figure it out together. So with that said, one way that we are going to move forward is the mayor's gonna come up and talk to us a bit about his vision, how we got here, where we're going. We're also gonna have the author, Debbie Irving. She wrote the book, Waking Up White. We have Caesar McDowell here from MIT. And we also have two wonderful young people from Teen Empowerment who are also going to provide framing for how racism works and what that experience is like for their lives, what it means to navigate the world. So without further ado, I'm gonna spend my last thank you on Mayor Walsh for 
number one, appointing me for this role as Chief Resilience Officer. So thank you, Mayor Walsh, for that, for this incredible opportunity to be a part of your leadership, to be a part of your vision for how we move forward collectively as a city. I want to thank Mayor Walsh for having faith in me to be able to lead this process in the way that we did. And I would like to thank him for creating the platform that allows us to be here together with each other and what's coming forward in 2017. And the way we're gonna wrap up today after we open it up for our discussion is we are gonna talk about those next steps. And you're gonna walk out of here with a copy of the blueprint, which is the framework for the principles and in uh, strategy, uh, the framework for the strategy uh, that we're going to release for our city's resilient strategy. So you, all of you will have access to a copy as you leave to take with you. Those who are watching on the live stream, you will be able to access that online after the session is over. So without further ado, I get to welcome your mayor, our mayor, the wonderful Mayor Martin J. Walsh to the stage. Thank you, Atia, and thank you for, for, that, for that great introduction. But more importantly, thank you for all the work that you're doing um, and what you've done already um, in, in, in convening so many different discussions and talking about so many different people and putting together an incredible committee. So thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank Jim Rooney uh, from the uh, Chamber of Commerce, but before that, Jim Rooney for his leadership at the Convention Center. And, and, and when I gave a speech at the Chamber of Commerce not too long ago, uh, Jim said right afterwards, actually right after I spoke, he said, we got to do this in the Chamber of Commerce, uh, get the business community to step up here and do some things. I want to thank you, Jimmy, uh, for following through on that and everything that you do. Um, Otis Raleigh, thank you very much. We're going to hear from more from Otis yes, later on. But yesterday I was talking, Otis, I'm not going to say what you said in the room, but uh, Boston Strong, baby. Thank you very much for everything you do uh, and, and what you're doing. Um, Pam Edinger, who's going to be uh, moderator today, uh, thank you, Pam, uh, for the great work you do, not just here in the city, but at the, at the college, but also uh, anytime we call, you're there for us. Uh, there's a lot of people in this room uh, that I should be giving shout outs to and thank yous to. I can't get into them all and I'm not going to mention them all, but I do want to thank, uh, mention a few elected officials that are here because these elected officials, and I might have missed a couple coming in, uh, from day one, uh, they've been part of a conversation, whether it's them personally in their districts or, or as a city, and I want to thank them all. Uh, State Representative Russell Holmes, Sheriff Steve Tompkins, City Council Ayanna Presley, uh, District Attorney Dan Conley, City Council Nisha Sabi, George, and other folks, if I miss you, uh, I'll get you. I want to thank you for your great work. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chief Willie Gross and Commissioner Billy Evans from the Boston Police Department that are here with us today who are doing that work inside the police department. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in things happen for a reason. Uh, there's no question about it in my life. I can go back to dozens and dozens and dozens of stories that something happened here and something good happened there, something bad happened here, something good happened over here, or, or the other way around. I, I firmly believe that. And, and I think that the same can be said in this presidential election, what happened. And I know that there's, there's a lot, I can feel a lot of tension in the city of Boston. These conversations that, we, that we're having today and that we're starting today actually started three and a half years ago. It just so happens that we happen to be at this theater today after what happened a week and a half ago. It might not be a coincidence that we're all here today. This started three and a half years ago when I was in a Mondays with the mayor. I was running for mayor of the city of Boston in Jamaica Plain, and a black woman stood up. And the forum was, I'd go to talk about my vision for the city of Boston, and I'd listen to questions from people, and I'd answer it. And, and I had a, a, a long history of being an elected official. I was a state representative. I represented one of the most, if not the most, diverse districts in the Massachusetts legislature. My zip code, 02125, was the fifth most diverse zip code in the United States of America, and still is. And, and I thought I had the, the conversation about race down. And I was running for mayor, and I was, you know, going out there, and any time that the race conversation came up, or any time the race came up, it's, it's a tough conversation to have. I'd kind of take a little, little bit of a deep breath and think about, okay, here we go. And a woman said to me, she says, what do you think of, what's the state of racism in Boston today? And when you're running for mayor, I mean, you don't want to say bad things. You want to say good things. 
And I said, well, you know, um, you know, I, we're doing better today than we did before. Um, and she pushed me on it. And then she challenged me on the people that were helping me campaign. And she said, where's the diversity of your campaign? I said, well, we have diversity in the campaign. And she said, well, are they here? I said, no, not here today. People aren't here today. But we do have diversity. And she kept pushing me, and, I, I, and it threw me off for the rest of the night. And I put on the smile and I did the, the good political thing and the good candidate thing and, you know, kept a good chin up and tried to talk to her afterwards. And I felt that, you know, to some degree, maybe she was a little unreasonable with me and not being fair because she put me on the spot. And I thought maybe she was supporting John Barros or something and she was in there getting me, <laughs> you know. I say, yo, John sent her over. Well, Charlotte sent her over. What am I going to do? Or Felix sent her over. What am I going to do? And, and, but, but that night, that night I, 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 was, I was upset. I was angry. I was angry for a whole bunch of different reasons. I was angry because the question was asked of me. I was angry because I didn't have the right answer. I was angry because uh, a lot of different things. And we went back um, the next day uh, to Joyce Lenihan's house where, where we did all our policy and we said, we got to talk about this issue. And I need an answer. I, I can't say we're better than we were. That's not an answer. And then we started to talk about getting into a deep conversation about where are we in Boston as, in racism? Where are we really in Boston? because no one's really talked about it publicly. You know, at least not that I remember it being talked about publicly. It's been talked about publicly in, in pockets of neighborhoods, maybe in a church or maybe in the street corner, maybe in a coffee shop, uh, but it really wasn't talked on, on, a, on a larger scale. And we, we started talking about it, and what we come up with was that we are going to have a, if we get elected, we're going to have a, a, a discussion on racism in Boston. And we announced that, and we said, this is what we're going to do. And, and, then, and, then, and then, we, then we applied for the 100 resilient cities, and the 100 resilient cities, when you put the application together, it's mostly about the environment, but ours was different. We talked about racism, we talked about busing, we talked about difficult things that, 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 that people are angry about or people don't want to talk about, and if they do want to talk about, in a lot of ways, they want to be confrontational. Not, not because they want to be confrontational, but they just want to, they want to be like, wait a second, what are you talking about? Jimmy Rooney talked a little bit about it when he, when he spoke. And we applied for that grant and we were able to accept that grant. And we began the conversation. And, and some reports have been, papers have written and people have said, oh, it takes a tremendous amount of courage for you to do this and why would you want to do this? It's not, a, it's not about courage, it's not, it doesn't take courage. This is the right conversation at the right time to have in the right city in the United States of America. That's what this is about. It's my hope that someday we'll look back on today. And not every Bostonian is in this room. We have about 649,000 Bostonians that couldn't get, make it here today. <laughs> and it's important for us to understand that because this is about a, a new chapter in Boston's history. Now last Tuesday, a week ago Tuesday, was a tough election, tough for me. Me personally. And I, and I, and I, and I went to bed that night and I shut the TV off and it wasn't over, but I knew it was over and I woke up the next day and I turned the TV on and I realized it, wasn't, it was over. It was over in one sense. And I went to work the next day and I could feel this, this sadness, this cloud over, over City Hall. In particular, with a lot of different groups of people that work there, but in particular, some of the younger people that work, for, work in the administration. So I asked Dan, I said, can you put together, bring ONS down and bring some people down to the office, let's talk about it. And I went into that room and I saw a lot of sad faces. I saw some crying, I saw some kids very upset, and I say kids, I don't mean to be disrespectful, they're great young people. And I said to them that day, just like I'm saying to the thousand people in this theater, there's one of two things that we can do. One is we can, we can just kind of sit back for the next four years and watch things come apart and be critical on the sideline and see things change in a bad way. Or we can take this, this, this election and take strength from it so we continue to bring change to our city. Because not one person can change what's happening in our city. When I mean that by a leader. But what I did say to them one person can make a change in our city. And I said, let's dig down deep. So when you leave here today and you start talking about what 
you saw today, what you experienced today, I want you to think about that. This dialogue is not about Marty Walsh. This dialogue is not about me and courage in taking this conversation on. The office that I hold and the people that are with me, we might have started this conversation. But this conversation is really all of you in this room and the thousands of other people that are dying to have this conversation right now in the city of Boston. This isn't a bold aspiration. This is a time where our, our nation is in, in great transition. We have no idea where the leading is gonna take us. But I can tell you, in Boston, we are not gonna go backwards. We are going forward. Now, what would a dialogue be without a quote? <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. said, the hardest places in hell are reserved for those who in a period of moral crisis maintain their neutrality. Think about that. We've been talking and, and planning these discussions for over two years. At this moment in Boston's history, we're gonna take a stand. We're gonna answer the call to put safety, the rights and the equality for everyone in our city at the top of the agenda every single day. In order for us to continue moving forward, we must be a city that produces and reproduces every single day, and that's what we're gonna do. When we assess these values, it's tempting to think of a, our city as different. You know, I'm proud of the progress that we've made, our leadership has made in this city over the last three years. We are no strangers to inequality. Yesterday or today, we're certainly not immune to history in our city. We know the unique struggles of our, of our country. Religious bigotry and racism arrived with the first colonists. We know that. It's been written about, it's been talked about, it's been spoken about. In many of our own lifetimes, some people in this room, whether it's the busing conflict that brought national attention and neighborhood division to our city, deep scars still remain in our city from that. We have disparities in race, in education, in health, in wealth. We know that. It's nothing new, nothing that anyone in this room hasn't heard before. The main tension in America, I think, is between the ideals and our reality, and how do we continue to move forward. This is what we're here to do. We're here to break the tension. And you can feel it in this room today. We're here to share our experiences, something that has to happen. We're here to talk to each other in a spirit of openness. We need to do that if we truly want to start healing. This isn't about judging one another. This is about learning from one another. I've heard this more than one time. Why are you talking? Why don't you take action? The answer is that change is made possible by people. That's the answer. We are taking action. We're taking action by talking, by sitting down, by understanding. I want us to be, continue to be a strong city. We're a strong city in so many ways. I could stand up here and John Barros could stand up here with me and we could talk about all the great things about Boston and how we're doing so well economically and how strong we are in the country and the world, and we are. We can talk about how our population is bigger than more than any other, almost a money at a time in our country. We, we had a plan to hit 700,000 people by the year 2030. We're gonna be close to 800,000 people by 2030. We can talk about the great successes there. But in order to be truly a strong city, we need to understand each other. And that's something that we have to do. My story, a lot of you know my story. I grew up in Dorchester. I grew up in a working class family. My parents were immigrants, they came from Ireland. They came here with really not much. 
I told a story the other day, my mother and father came to this country not to find the American dream, but to send money back home to their family in Ireland. How many immigrants in our country, in our city today, that are here still today, that might be undocumented, that are here to send money back home? They worked hard. And they gave me every chance, my brother, every chance that, that I needed to be successful. I had the opportunity in 1997 to run for state representative, and as I said earlier, I won. And I represent the, one of the most diverse districts in the, in, the, in, the, in the state house. I work side by side with people of all races and ethnicities to make sure that we had a better life for everybody. That's what I did. I fought against inequality, and I fought against racism, and I fought against disparities while I was a representative. I never thought of myself as privileged. And I didn't think really at that time of Boston as a city of racism. I knew there was issues and we had issues, but I really didn't think a lot about it because we were trying to move, move things forward just like my colleagues are here today. I preferred, I focused on what we had in common. I focused on my colleagues, Russell Holmes is here today and, and Russell and myself both represent districts that are diverse and districts that have poor people in them and people that some people are doing okay, middle class, that's what I focused on. But recently I got a lesson in thinking of understanding to what barriers really are. I don't know if he's here today, but Will Morales, the commissioner of Boston Senate for Youth and Families, we had a conversation in the office after one of the incidents in the country. Many, a couple of the people that work with me said, we need to have a conversation, Mayor, about race in Boston. And we had about 25 people in the room, and I was the only white person in the room. And we were talking about challenges of how do I deal with as a mayor and how do I say when I get in front of a camera to make sure that I'm truly speaking for everyone in the city of Boston. And we talked about, the conversation went into neighborhoods and how I grew up and how other people grew up and we all grew up kind of the same. A lot of us grew up almost in the same neighborhood. But Will talked about learning to drive. And, he, and it was a simple question. And he was talking about learning when I learned to drive, when he learned to drive, and when he was teaching his son how to drive a car. And we, it's the same thing. You know, we have to learn the gas and the brake. We have to learn the shifts and the gears. We have to learn the signals. We have to learn parallel parking. We have to learn going straight and forward and back and straight in all their ways. But something changed with the, with the education of that process. When we talked about getting pulled over, and he said, I, I'm teaching my son when he gets pulled over to take his wallet out and put it on the dashboard. And this story isn't against the police department, by the way. This is just reality. Just so we're clear we talk about this. He said, you keep your hands on the wheel. And when you see the officer, answer yes, sir, no, sir. Don't talk back. Don't shift around. Myself and I use Jimmy Rooney from Southie as an example, had a different experience. Our first move when we got pulled over might have been to try and think of somebody we know in the police department and throw every name we can possibly throw out there. And then if that didn't work, we went to some family members. And the chances are that we might have known somebody, but the point of it is those experiences are very, very different. So when you think about it, if you're sitting in this room today and you're saying, well, you know, I grew up poor, this person grew up poor, I grew up on housing development, this person grew up on housing development, my father was this, this person's father was this. I grew up in a single family, I grew up in a single family. There are definitely differences. And that's what's gonna come out in some of the conversations that we had. The beauty about the conversation was that we had a conversation. It wasn't defensive, I didn't get insulted. No one got insulted about the conversation. We didn't get angry. And that's what the point of the dialogues are all about. Understanding, healing, bonds of healing, together working together as one city. 
part of the conversation. That's what we're doing today. We're starting a conversation. We're going to make sure that as we do this, these conversations are going to go into every neighborhood in the city of Boston. These conversations are going to go from Roxbury to West Roxbury, from Brighton to Mattapan, and every single neighborhood in between. And that's what we need to do. I urge you all to get involved. I urge you all to help us facilitate these, these conversations. I help you to share what you heard today. I ask you to push back on something you don't agree today with, because sometimes it's important to have these dialogues. We are at an important moment in time in the city of Boston, the United States of America. I'm not going to dwell any more on the presidential election today, or at least for this conversation today. <laughs> all that I know, except for this last thing, <laughs> all that I know is that the day after the presidential election, when I was in that room talking to those young people, talking to their sadness, talking to their, what they thought their hopes and dreams were over, many of them are here with us today. And they're in a part of history that this never happened, well this happened I guess 40 years ago, but a different conversation 40 years ago. We are about to take a race conversation to the city of Boston to completely heal the wounds of the past. And people that don't need to be healed, then don't worry about it. But the people that need to be healed, we're going to do it. We are going to, I was asked a question by a reporter, by Meg Irons from the Boston Globe, and I think Meg's here. Thank you, Meg, for the coverage of these stories. <laughs> Meg said, what happens after the conversations are over? The point is, these conversations never end. We will be back one year from now to talk about the progress we made. But for as long as I am the mayor of the city of Boston, I will continue to come back to talk about where we are as a city, where we are with discussions, where we are with actual feelings in our community. From the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for being here today. As I said in the beginning, I am a firm believer things happen for a reason. If I didn't have that conversation in July of 2013, and that woman didn't come up and challenge me, we wouldn't be here today. Thank you very much. So we're transitioning. We're gonna have Mayor Walsh and the wonderful Dr. Pam Edinger from Bunker Hill Community College come up and we want to have a conversation with you all. Good afternoon, everybody. So a conversation is a two-way street, and we've been talking at you for about an hour and a half. Um, I was feeling sorry for Dante because he had to follow Kendra, but I really feel sorry for the mayor that he has to follow <laughs> both of them. <laughs> So somehow, I get no ovations, and he gets two, two. <laughs> What's that all about? So some housekeeping. How many of you have phones today? Don't turn them off, because we know that we will not be able to get to all of you today. But please, use your 140 characters to tweet. You see the Twitter handles up there? You see the hashtag? The two questions that we're going to ask today that we hope you focus on, BOS resilience, and hashtag I am Boston. So make sure your tweets actually have those on it so we can gather information from you. The two questions that we like to post to you today, and the mayor um, will comment on those as well, is one, as we roll this out in the, in the months and, and days and months forward, how do you want this to take shape in your community? How do you want those meetings to sound like, look like, um, feel like? Because it's your community meetings. The second thing is, tell us, what is the one thing that you want to get out of these conversations as they happen in your community? Now, those will focus you a little bit. And we have microphones on both sides of the aisle. Those folks who are interested in making comments, and I'm keeping time, I think we can do eight, maybe 10. Um, if you would um, raise your hand. And the folks in the, in the balcony, please be careful coming down if you wish to. And please line up at the microphones and we will get rolling. Okay? 
All right. Um, sir? Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Mayor, for having this. It's, it's wonderful that you're doing this, and I thank those two youth who got up and speak. I think it's amazing. My name is Peter Hill, and uh, two years ago, Governor Patrick appointed me to a working group on family law. And uh, part of the working group, we had 19 people, and we came up with a new child-centered family law bill. And I think you can't have a conversation of race without going into really what's important about having family and bring family together and fathers back into kids' lives. Um, the child-centered family law bill did pass the House. It didn't pass the, uh, the Senate, unfortunately, by the Judiciary Committee. But um, I ask that people be educated on the child-centered family law bill and also when they talk about incarceration is that more people, more men usually, especially men of color, are incarcerated for inability to pay child support and inability to, to they lose their driver's licenses, which only prevents them from seeing their kids, being involved with their kids. So I just ask that the city support the child-centered family law bill to help bring kids back and bring families back together. All right, thank you. Hello, Mayor Wash. Um, my name is uh, Jason Wallace, and I just, I'm originally from Chicago, and I moved here to complete my master's at Tufts. And like one of the things that I, I kind of wanted to address is, is the fact that as a young black male, like there's, there's two folds. There's the, the one that Dante talked about, like in terms of being in these neighborhoods and the ability to make good decisions. But then I find myself on the other side of it where I'm a person that has achieved and have done all these things to put myself through the measures. And I don't know if that places me in a better position based on like some of like the systematic institutional racism that uh, exists in terms of how you're like kind of locked out of uh, opportunity in a way. So one of my things that, that really helped me growing up was the fact that Chicago had so many programs that were made public that helped me navigate it. So like, I just want to know, like, how are you guys planning to really address some of these issues uh, in terms of helping people navigated in terms of alloc allocation of resources. Well, thank you for the question. Let me just say to you, um, we have many of those same programs that Chicago had. Uh, one of the things I would suggest to you uh, when you talk about um, being in two worlds, kind of, uh, we have what's called the Mayor's Mentoring Movement. It was a movement started by President Obama that uh, was, came out of my brother's keeper. So I'd, the first thing I'd ask you to do is make sure you sign up for the Mayor's Mentoring Movement to get part of what we're doing. And also my brother's Keeper Initiative, which the president started two and a half years ago. Boston jumped in, and we're probably the leading city in America right now working with the president. Um, and and I, we have tons of programs. But I think it's at the point now where we have a lot of programs. It's about action. Uh, and, and the young people talked about it. Dante talked about uh, being in... Um, growing up and making some mistakes along the way. And now he's talking about working for teen empowerment and learning from his mistakes, I think, if I can speak for you, and taking what he experienced as, as on one side, as I did, and now taking it to a positive side and how do you move forward? And I think that that's what we have to do here. So we do, we do have a lot of opportunities. Uh, as you walk out, as you walk back, there's about four rows behind you to the right. There's a woman there, Lauren Jones. Whenever just raise your hand real quick, just to get you tied in to, to talk about uh, what we're doing in the city of Boston and, and using you. It, it, it's, again, it goes back to that conversation I had in the Eagle Room with the, with the young people in the city of Boston. They can do one of two things. They can either sit for the next four years and, and, and cry about losing the election, which we could all do, I guess, or we could actually step up and say, okay, this, this thing happened. It's, it's history. It's going to be on a wall someday. We're going to move forward, continue in the city. So we need you to work with us to continue to move forward. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dr. Monica O'Neill. I'm a clinical psychologist in Boston, and I'm a lecturer in the Harvard Medical School. And one of the things I really like to focus on is the issue of diversity and race, especially within interpersonal relationships. And so um, what, one of the number one things I heard a couple of times is the idea of having this conversation without there being a lot of hostility and whatever. And my biggest concern was is that 
seems a bit unfair in terms of how to have this conversation because the issue of race and racism creates so much emotionality and it feels like a bit a way of limiting the truth of what needs to be heard. So one of the things I'd like to hear going forward is perhaps a change in your rhetoric instead of saying like no hostility, but actually like I really want to hear your emotions as clear or as, as raw as they are. That's Thank one you. thing. Let me finish. <laughs> The second thing, one of the other second things that I did not get, that I was hoping to hear and hoping to look for, is a clear statement that Boston has an issue with racism. And I, I didn't hear that at all today. And I would have loved to hear that, because that to me, again, as a psychologist, I think of the only way to make changes is to acknowledge a problem. Okay, let me, um, I let me start thing. with the- Can I do just one more thing well, so let, I can let, cover let, it all? Because I don't me, know if I have a chance let to Let me respond so I don't forget. Okay. Um, <laughs> Boston has an issue with racism. Great, thank you. And today is not the first conversation. Today, today is many conversations we've had up until today, which today is the first, I guess, official kickoff of how we're gonna move forward in dialogue. Okay. And I think that what's gonna happen today, to bring up your point of hostility, what we mean, meant by that is, of course there's gonna be raw feeling, of course there's gonna be emotion, of course there's gonna be uh, anger and sadness and emotion in a dialogue, because uh, you don't get to healing unless you get that conversation out. And I think what people today are taking notes in the front row is that we are going to be getting facilitators who are gonna be coordinating and working in, in conversations. The facilitator is not gonna be directing the conversation. The facilitator is gonna facilitate the conversation. And I think that's a lot different than what we're doing today. What I didn't wanna to do today is I didn't necessarily want this conversation where people ask the mayor a question, the mayor gives an answer. Uh, really what we wanna do is hear about, hear about ways of how do we move this conversation forward. Your comment, your question, the first part of your question is exactly what we need to hear so we can begin the process. Okay. Third point. So, okay, so yes, racism is an issue in Boston. We're gonna have, um, yeah, thank you. The emotionality is a big part of the conversation. The last thing that I wanted to say is that throughout history, you can look at some of the major law schools, Harvard, Northwestern, Stanford, they've all done research that shows that people's social attitudes change as laws actually change. And so, you know, one of the, I'm not from Boston, I'm not, but I've lived here now for 11 years. I moved here from Washington, D.C. to do a postdoctoral fellowship. I'm also from South Carolina, and so I have a very different experience than your grandparents. And I have actually never experienced racism like I've experienced in my life until I moved to Boston. And I'm talking from a social perspective in my everyday life. And how it shows up oftentimes is the level of segregation in the communities that are part of the history of redlining, and also how it shows up in going to any given restaurant, any given social place, and seeing how it's like maybe I am one out of a hundred people in that position, in that place as a black person. When Boston is about 30%, 20 something like 30% black. And to me, I feel like that should be the way that the census is, should be across the board. So I actually think if you want Boston to be different, there needs to be real clear, real clear, um, you know, real clear recommendations or real, like actually have a law, like approach it like the EEOC where it says that it, you should be aiming to have your patrons, your jobs, your companies, whatever, reflect the actual census of Boston. And if not, then we are gonna audit you for some sort of level of discrimination because I don't think that happens in Boston. And if you want people to change, you're gonna have to actually create change by creating laws and then people will catch up. And that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. You know, it's right that we're in a theater because there are rock stars out there. Um, go ahead. Good afternoon. Mayor Walsh, I want to continue to applaud you for your leadership and commitment to diversity and inclusion. Thank you. My name is Sarah Ting. I head up an organization called World Unity, Inc. I'm originally from New York City. Don't hold it against me if I'm a Yankee fan. <laughs> it's okay, we have three World Series in the 21st century, you guys right. don't have any. Right, But I, I jumped out of my seat to come here. I came here because I knew this was gonna be a very 
very important conversation. I want, I'm coming here to offer you some items to be part of your wonderful dialogue on race. But I want to start with a, a quote by our wonderful Dr. Albert Einstein, who said, you cannot solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it. I'm going to repeat it so it sinks into all of our heads and hearts. You cannot solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it. You must stand on a higher ground. I'm going to share another quote with you from Mother Teresa. We all know that she was recently proclaimed a, a saint. So if you don't agree with her statement, don't argue with me. Go to her grave. She said, I've come to realize over the years that being unwanted is the worst disease that any human being can face. I'm going to repeat it again. And I hope there are a lot of healthcare providers in this conference. I've come to realize over the years that being unwanted is the worst disease that any human being can face. As I look around this audience, yes, it's diverse. Where are my fellow Asian brothers and sisters? Don't worry, I'll Good. hold you to task. Because I say that because I'm embarrassed to say what I'm about to say. I believe that some of my Asian brothers and sisters do not understand this issue of racism, do not think that they experience discrimination. I'm sorry to say that. What I want to bring to your wonderful race on dialogues on race, two things, Mayor Walsh. One, a public service announcement that started in Boston in 1985 to promote racial and ethnic harmony throughout the city of Boston. It started like this. Are you greater than the sun that shines on everyone? Black, brown, yellow, red, and white. The sun does not discriminate. There's a longer version of it now air, that's aired on Channel 7 TV and Fox TV. Are you greater than the sun that shines in everyone? Black, brown, yellow, and white, red and white. The sun does not discriminate. It shines on men and women, rich and poor, old and young, gay and straight, mentally and physically challenged, all religions, all of humanity. So I want to offer this PSA to you, Mayor Walsh, to be part of the dialogues on race. So maybe it can be a catalyst. It can invite each of us to look within ourselves because policies do not change themselves. Systems do not change themselves. Institutions do not change themselves. They change when we have an enlightened leader like you who's willing to speak out, have the courage, and address this issue head on and understands that conversations have to start first, but the change has to start within each of our hearts first. The last thing I want to share with you is a song. I'm not going to sing it because I'm not a good <laughs> singer. <laughs> but the song was inspired by the Sun poem, and we have a video of it. It's only two minutes long. And the song was performed at the United Nations last year by children. It was first performed here in, the, in Plymouth, Massachusetts, by 100 children in a concert. So I bring this to you, Mayor Walsh, for your consideration as part of these powerful dialogues that you want to carry throughout the year to help move forward the dialogue on race. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you. All right, thank you. And, and somebody find that song and tweet it, please. Um, I'm, I'm watching time. I think um, we're, we're getting to our, our last five to eight minutes, so. I'll go quick. Good morning, Mayor Walsh. My name is Roxana Myrom. I grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts. I live in Cambridge now, and I work in Boston. Earlier in the talk, I saw you pause yourself to clarify that you weren't speaking against the police officers in Boston. I, as a white, privileged woman, I'm afraid of the police right now, and it is hard for me to fathom what my brothers and sisters of color feel every day. I really hope that these conversations will address the issues and break the tension around the discussion about 
police brutality, about violence, about the, I mean, the body cameras, about the Black Lives Matter signage versus All Lives Matter, th that conversation feels scary. And I want to give you whatever encouragement I have as a citizen to go there as a leader, even though it's going to be difficult. And I hope that others in the room will support you in that. I want there to be progress. I don't want it to be a fight. But I'm scared. The, the, the conversations that we're going to have on race are conversations that are going to talk about difficult, complex issues. And I think that, again, as we talk with the facilitators, as people start to talk about what does it happen. So, for example, we've had two, two race dialogues I've been part of, uh, one with elected officials from Boston and one with people from Boston. Um, both of those took a different, different tone as far as where the conversation went. And it was interesting, and I think these dialogues are, there's no consistent, uh, just much like the, the counselor who spoke, the clinical counselor who spoke, psychologist who spoke a minute ago, uh, when you have a patient in front of you who are both drug addicted, the feelings and, and, and the conversation to healing is two very different conversations many different times. And I think that there's no question about that during conversations we're going to be talking about policing. We're going to be talking about brutality. We're going to be talking about diversity. We're going to be talking about every other aspect of, of race that's going to be out there. But it, 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 is, it is, again, about healing a city. It's those conversations sitting at many of those tables are actually going to be police officers themselves that live in neighborhoods of Boston and other places. They're going to be having dialogues. The police department is going to be having a dialogue. There's going to be all of that. Some of the dialogue the police department has today, and I'm not going to go too much on the police department because it's not just about the police department. It, They've had dialogues with teen empowerment. So we, we have to have more and more and more of these dialogues as we move forward. So it's not just about, I mean, and people can, my wording, I mean, I guess anyone can take what I said today and analyze it and cut out certain words and said, you said this, what did you mean by that? Uh, this is the first conversation of a lot of conversations that are gonna happen in our city. Thank you. Um I want to be mindful of our schedule and be respectful, of folks who are in um, who are in line. I think we will take two more questions. Well, why don't we do this? What we'll do is, I I can't stay. Right. So we will keep having conversation, and I am going to when I have to move out. I'm going to ask maybe Dr. Tia Martin to jump in because I think it's important to hear from everyone in the room that wants to speak. Good. Um, and. This isn't, j just so people know in line and in the room, this isn't, isn't just necessarily about asking Marty Walsh a question and getting an answer. This is about having you give your ideas and thoughts. I've already gotten two ideas, three different thoughts today about these dialogues. One is about dealing with, right off the bat, putting racism out there, uh, dealing with how come restaurants and, and, and places that we go into the city of Boston, even though we are a 50% people of color city, how come that in some neighborhoods it just looks like me and in other neighborhoods it looks like uh, different people? And then also the police question. So you, we need to hear from you on this stuff. Okay. So we're going to go here and then Atia is going to come out in a minute and if I'm not here, it doesn't mean I'm not listening. I'll get it all, trust me. Okay. I'll say in this moment that I'll give the floor to Principal Vega if... <laughs> Mayor Walsh, your time is limited. I would like to, you to hear from him. Oh, my goodness. Andrew. Oh. <laughs> this is how Congress should be. Wow. I yield to the gentleman. <laughs> he's uh, serving our children. He's letting them know that they're loved. He's sending out letters to them the day of 11-9. I think it's important to give him the floor in this moment. <laughs> so, well, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, my this, God. Oh, okay. This is Principal Andrew Vega from so the Bates Elementary yeah. School. Hi. Um, so, <laughs> in the spirit of the questions you asked, Pam, you. Uh, something that I would like from, to come from these dialogues, a lot of the work we've done at the Bates has been around equity, and I feel like a lot of times it goes on individual schools. We've had race dialogues, Mayor Walsh. We've made these decisions that have benefited primarily our students of color. To those with privilege, equity feels like oppression. And something that I would hope comes from these dialogues is those with privilege understand that with equity, they are not losing anything. Yeah. 
because we, we have a lot of work to do. I worked in a school that used to have segregated classrooms, and I can tell you now that we don't have those anymore, we are better for it. And a personal challenge to you, Mr. Mayor, in your opening remarks, you talked about the importance of not remaining neutral in these times. Please tell our governor that. That would not have been the first time that Andrews told the mayor what to do. So <laughs> I would like to um, at least wrap up this portion and, and thank the mayor. Let's hear one more. One, one more. more? Oh. So I'll talk about, there's so many things I can talk about. Um, I went to Emerson College. I graduated from Emerson College. So to be in this room is amazing. Thank you, Lisa, my best friend from orientation for being here and coming up from Rhode Island so we can be in this moment and this activity together, the city that we came into together that we love so very much. Um, so I'll speak in this moment as a business owner, um, former business owner. Um, I work and I'm a, we're residents in Roslindale and there need to be more pipelines for equity um, for women of color to own businesses. So many businesses open and close two years, three years, two years, three years, and nobody comes around to say what went wrong, what can we do better, and how can we make this better. I've spoken about this before, that there need to be small business retail incubators throughout the city of Boston for working systems. We can talk about a lot of different things and share a lot of feelings, but we need more programs and more pipelines. Additionally, we need more pipelines so our K through 12 students in Boston public schools can go to these amazing colleges and universities that are in their backyards. We, we can't brag about having the first public education in the nation and the best colleges and universities in the world if our own children aren't prepared to go to those institutions. Thank you. Uh, we are doing a lot of that. And again, this isn't the point of today's discussion, but we are doing a lot of that equity work uh, in, in our economic development cabinet. To my left, Mr. Barros. Yeah, John Barros right there. Okay. And, but we, we have to do, I think, I think one of the, through these conversations as well, getting the information out that we're doing in the city. We're clearly not getting it out to enough people to let people know the work we're doing. So we have to figure out how do we get that out. And through these discussions, a lot of good information is going to get out to people. The foundation's already been laid down. So thank you. So I want to quote Ann Braden. The battle is and has always been a battle for the hearts and minds of white people in this country. The fight against racism is our issue. It's not something that we're called on to do to help people of color with. We need to become involved with it as if our lives depended on it, because really in truth, they do. And so at a very young age, as a white girl in Boston, a black girl asked me why my people teach their children to call them the N-word and give them the middle finger when all they're trying to do is get what I have. And I've spent the last 40 years trying to understand that. And I am so happy that a white elected official who looks like me, who I had very little confidence in understanding this issue, has taken the time to learn. Thank you. And I spend, no, and, and because in my work as a fierce racial justice warrior, I've always understood that if the leadership isn't with it, it isn't gonna happen. So none of us that look like us get a pass. And we need to, I believe, use facts and data and stories in our neighborhoods when we do these dialogues. And I'm going to ask all white people to never refer to school desegregation as busing, because it negates the over 400 years of oppression and the over 200 years that black people and their white allies fought against public policies that resulted in Judge Garrity coming and having to do what he had to do. I've come to understand trauma. I was traumatized because people that look like me didn't have the courage or the will to do what God has taught me and my mother to do. 
do unto others as you would have do unto you. So I stand as a racial justice warrior with my white people to lead you. So the second thing I'll ask in the neighborhoods is you create the space for for um, white folks to work through our mess together because it isn't fear for white folks who suffer from white fragility and the denial of white racial superiority that's been ingrained in us to have to work that through with people of color. Thank you. And that we then caucus with each other and that all of us are asked today and at every meeting, what can you do in your heart today to dismantle white supremacy in your mind, in your workplace, in your place of worship. Thank you very much. And pay Thank taxes, because taxes needed to dismantle this stuff. We as white people and of government created it. We're obligated morally. A round of let, applause, let just, ladies let, and gentlemen. Thank you very much. And, and that's a lot of why we're here today. Yes. Thank you. And, and I, I, again, I apologize. I have to go. Dr. Atia Martin is going to be here, and she's awesome. Um, and I want to thank everyone for being here today. Um, this is not the end. This is the beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Walsh. So it's you and me. So it's you and me. We're, which, we're, which, which end should we start? There we go. So we're going to so come again, over here. So Rephrase the question, right? Which is, what do you want to see when this dialogue goes to your neighborhood? And two, what it is that you want to come out of it, your highest hope? That's Those right. two things. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Look familiar faces on stage. So when this dialogue comes to my neighborhood, and I live in the Rosendale Hyde Park area, what I want to see is not just the conversation that you're having with me and my neighbors, the ones that are willing to come out to that community center on that Thursday night for dinner of cold spaghetti and warm lemonade while we sit around and talk about our feelings. What I also want to know is the neighbors that you're not going to get there who have no intention of showing up to this, of the people who live on the other side of Rosendale that isn't an environmental justice track, who live in Doctor's Row, who are not spending their evenings out there. How are you going to reach them? Because those are the doctors who feel like black people have superpowers and don't deserve to get prescribed pain medication at the same rate. Those are the people who lead organizations and CEOs of businesses who, no matter the best intentions of the people on the ground floor, are creating entire institutions and rules to make sure that no one ever, that looks like me, ever gets to a certain echelon of their company. And I need to know, besides the people in that room, how are you going to reach the people who aren't there? Because those are the people who we really need to talk to. Thank you for that. So straightforward answer, and I think it's a theme that we've been talking about this whole morning, is that we all have work to do, and those attitudes that you just laid out are a part of all of us, right? And so it's not just the people who aren't going to be in the room, it's the people who are going to be in the room. What we've learned is that the more intelligent we are, the more confident we are, the more we feel like we got this racism, social justice, racial equity stuff under control, the more blind spots we have. And so it's both, right? And so all of us have work to do, and that's a theme that we've heard, but it's also this idea that there are people who will not be in those rooms, and the, that's the purpose of us continuing to do this, because we're trying to shift culture, we're trying to shift practice, so that this isn't just about what we say, it's about how we behave and what we do. Um, and so the, for us in, to be able to get there, this is the hard work of continuing to grind. The folks who are ready will come along. Other people will come along later. Some people may never come along. We don't know. But the idea here is that we create as many opportunities as possible for people to engage where they are and how they are. So thank you for the question, Ms. Kristen. I didn't say my name. Sir, if you give us your name and tell us what, what what you sure. want to happen in your community. My name is Rod Singleton, and I have to say that uh, I'm from Roxbury. We, we in Roxbury feel like um, inclusiveness around trade unions is, is not 
a reality. And so when you come to my neighborhood, we'd like something behind that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My name is Carol Ridge Martinez, um, and I'm a neighborhood planner. And I've lived and worked in Boston for almost all of my life in almost every neighborhood of Boston. But right now, I live and work in Brighton and Alston. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the long history of housing segregation in Boston. And I want to, uh, us to explore that as part of what we do in our work. And then really spend some time thinking about how we make our neighborhoods more divor diverse. When I started to work in Brighton and Austin, and I'd walk into a community meeting, I'd be like, where are all the Latinos? I'd worked in a Latino neighborhood for a really long time. There are very few people of color, who, there are some who live there, but very few people who come out to our meetings. And I'd like to see if we can figure out how to finally get rid of the redlining. I mean, it really defines us, Beberg and redlining. It's the circle of promise. It defines everything about equity that we are in the city. And we need to finally break it. Thank you Thank very you. much. <laughs> Sir? So before we have the next question, I want to acknowledge something that is uh, really important to acknowledge. We did not have the Latino voice on stage today. So I want to acknowledge that explicitly and that as part of us making sure that we hold ourselves accountable and that we're transparent, that we acknowledge when things like that happen and make sure that we don't have those kind of gaps again. So thank you very much for making sure we bring that up. Yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Will Mba. I was born in Cameroon. I'm an immigrant. And uh, what I want to say is, you know, what are the, you know, uh, structures in place, like Lega Council, you know, that can help, you know, immigrants and people of color that are scared of being deported after this, you know, uh, election. I haven't heard much about it. how do we evolve from talking to practice. You know, and see that these people are also being taken care of. Thank, Thank you. you for that. We will be mindful. Up here in the balcony, we have Alejandra Sanguien from the Mayor's Office for Immigrant Advancement, who actually their whole mission is to support our immigrant community in the city of Boston. So we make sure you connect with her as well, okay? So we're going to come over here, sir. Hello, my name is Ron Goldman. I have a background in psychology. And I want to uh, advocate expanding the dialogue to include a mental health perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is very important. And racist behavior involves things such as emotional insensitivity. And in addition to working on changing racial behavior, we can also work on preventing mm -hmm. racial behavior. It is possible. And the way we can do that is to recognize that things like emotional insensitivity start very early in life, as early as infancy. This is the way we protect ourselves from trauma. Uh, we repress our feelings and withdraw emotionally. And that has long-term effects on adult feeling attitudes and behaviors. So a very important component here is to examine how do we treat infants? Do we satisfy their needs? Very often there's a disruption in the relationship between the infant and the mother. And if that relationship is disrupted, then the relationship between the infant and all of humanity is disrupted. So again, I just want to bring our attention to another component here. Let's take a look at how we treat infants starting from birth. And that can have wonderful effects on society because what's done to children, they will do to society. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Martin. Good morning, um, sir. One of the things that I'd like to posit into this conversation is our thoughts of restorative justice. Um, a lot of things happen. There was and is a lot that came with the previous election, but one of the things that happened was legalization of marijuana within Massachusetts. Um, with that coming, though, as we look at the effects of legalization, um, I hope that the live stream and the people that are in this room will begin to think of ways that we can do further justice to our ex-cons who have been disproportionately imprisoned. Um, now that the crime for which they were imprisoned has become legalized, how do we restore their rights as citizens? How do we make sure that Corey is no longer affecting their employment? 
how do we make sure that they still have economic rights, right? So as we look um, on whether or not marijuana is decided to be sold commercially or pharmaceutical, how do we then make sure that these people who have been um, oppressed and imprisoned have access to getting the certification that allows them to commercially sell that for which they were imprisoned or pharmaceutically distribute that for which they were imprisoned and be trained in doing so, um, so that it's not just uh, a market for wealthy white Americans who have now taken the advantage and the privilege that has come with years and years of dis disproportionate oppression. So that is what I'd like to posit and I hope that we can all reflect and, and uh, take action on this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, one, of, one of the things that I've been told by um, uh, our um, producer back there is that we, we, we have um, one additional speaker who's got a very interesting program to introduce to you, and we don't want to lose that. Um, so, <laughs> I know nobody wants to stop. We don't want to stop either. And I know that there's still some folks who are in line. So I'm going to propose that we turn over the stage to our speaker, and Lati uh, Atia and I will come to you to make sure that the questions that you have and the ideas that you have are captured. Will that work for everybody? I know folks are, um, folks have been here for a couple hours, so I don't want to lose this piece. Yes? Okay. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to you two. And... So you and I can go down and, yeah, and speak we'll to, folks. to folks. And let's turn over the this, this stage. So can we get the person who's helping, Ms. Jennifer, come up, please? Okay, well, while that's going on, we'll do one more. How's that? Sounds good. Okay, go ahead. McKay, there we and go. Danny Butler McKay, and I am a clinical social worker. I work over at Southern Jamaica Plain Health Center, and um, I'm trying to address the question about what I'd like to see in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I'm in Jamaica Plain. Um, I also endorse the piece about not Sorry. not leaving the heart out of this conversation. If we are afraid of feelings, then nothing is going to change. Right. And I think that there are some ways that we can have this conversation. I work now with white youth and youth of color in a racial reconciliation and healing project, so I've seen it happen, I've seen it work, and I know that we could mirror some of these things. So a few things that I would just share. One is we need a shared set of commitments, and I'll offer two. One is to commit to say what you feel and feel what you say. And then the other is to commit to hearing back what needs to be said as it needs to be said. Mm. We can ensure that there is safety in terms of physical violence and all of that, but I think it's important to welcome the heart into the room because that's, you know, that's what holds this all in place, right? The other thing is to think about a further shared set of definitions. I would offer that racial disparities racial equity and inequity or equity are different things and we're using them as if they're all interchangeable and they're not. Um, the last thing I would offer it, well, no, two more. <laughs> the other thing right. I would offer is a shared definition of how we are defining racism. Because mm -hmm. in all of our conversation about racism, we're not having a definition. And so we all have different thoughts about how we're defining racism. And the way we define it will drive the way that it is addressed in communities and in conversation. So, you know, I, I endorse the, share, the definition of racism being a system of advantage based on race. And in that, there's a question about um, who, who, who's, in, who's advantaged in this country. The last thing I will say is uh, the, somebody had said earlier about not wanting to be in a position where we're hearing some things. As folks of color, we have one role. Whites have another role, right, in terms of this work, the woman who did the Ann Braden comment. Um, and so I think that there's an important piece to be added in terms of racial affinity space. And I would like to see that. I've had a lot of conversations with people who want to just kind of keep it all nice and things don't change that way. You know, if we're looking at structural racism, we're looking at policy and practice, and if we're looking at outcomes, I'd love to see something happen in the schools because that's where we begin and at least that's one strategy. So shared definitions, looking at this as a, as a um, 
as a structural issue and not an interpersonal issue solely, and also having a place where we can address our own internalized racism, you know, so folks of color can address what we are, what we've taken in, which you all spoke to a bit, and white folks can be addressing white supremacy and all that goes along with that. So I just... Thank you for wrapping that up for us and bringing all of those pieces together again.